Olá, esse é o MauáCast, um podcast onde mentes inovadoras se encontram. Tecnologia, inovação, empreendedorismo e conhecimento. Tudo com aquela pegada da Mauá. Well, we are here and we are very happy today. And we are with Professor uh, Javier Serra. And we will talk about uh, music and technology and computing. And uh, uh, we are here also with Professor Ricardo Balistiero. Uh, and we will, and we will try to give you some ideas about this impressive area that mix arts, uh, uh, mathematical models, uh, software and technology and arts. And, and of course, what is the correlation with the activities here in uh, Mao Institute of Technology? Professor Javier, welcome. Uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to this talk. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to, to be with you and uh, share whatever I can share with, uh, with you and uh, answer any question you might have. Okay, thank you. Um, if you could introduce yourself for our students, for our community, just to... Do you have an idea about your career? Okay. Uh, yes, well, I am uh, Javier Serra. I am a, a professor at the Pompeu Fabra University in Barcelona. And um, I lead a research group. Uh, the name of the research group is the, is the Music Technology Group. And that's within an engineering school of the university. And this uh, research group is, uh, is quite large. Uh, we are um, close to uh, 40 uh, people uh, doing research in various aspects of, uh, of music technology. And, um, well, uh, I reach uh, here after uh, quite a, a long uh, career uh, within this field. I have been uh, working in this, I would say, uh, 40 years. Uh, so when I finished my undergraduate degree, uh, this area was uh, not uh, very established, for sure not in Spain and uh, in, in very few places you could study this type of uh, topics. So I went to the US uh, where I did a, a master's degree, first in Florida, and then I did a PhD at Stanford University, which at that time was uh, maybe the most reputed center in music technology uh, around the world. That's, uh, I did the PhD in topics related to uh, sound analysis and synthesis uh, for, of course, for music applications and uh, to create uh, new sounds that could be of interest uh, to musicians, to composers. Uh, after uh, doing my PhD, um, I worked uh, for Yamaha. Uh, Yamaha at that time had a research center in California next to Stanford. And that um, I worked there for some time. But of course, I wanted to come back to Barcelona, where I am from. So uh, I, uh, I applied for some uh, uh, grant to be able to come back. And I got it, and that was the time that the uh, Olympics uh, were happening in Barcelona. So that was uh, 92, and that was a good time for the for the city. Uh, and therefore, there was a, a lot of things being started. One of them being uh, a new university, which was the uh, Universitat Pompeu Fabra, and therefore I I could join the university. Uh, it was a university being new that uh, they were very much open to new ideas, new topics, new research. So they were very much welcoming uh, uh, me to, to start uh, uh, the research in music technology. Of course, first I was uh, just alone. And through all these years, uh, the group has, uh, has uh, extended, has uh, incorporated many people. And uh, we have been opening up our field quite a lot. And so now the music technology group is uh, quite a, a reference uh, group that uh, hosts many researchers, welcomes many master and PhD students. And uh, we cover quite a bit of the different topics related to music technology. Okay, thank you, Professor. 
Oh, uh, I, I read the, the material of the, the website of your, your group, our, our research group. I have a question about a, a kind of philosophical part of this introduction. It's about the, the preservation of the sound ecosystem and the cultural aspects. Uh, we know we, we have a lot of technology involved in audio, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And uh, it, 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 there is a, a lot of things involved in sounds and music. And if you could talk about uh, this sound ecosystem preservation in this cultural aspects preservation, it's important to understand, uh, as you know, Brazil is uh, as a rich country in, in, in music and, <coughs> and several types of sounds, if you, if you can say like that. Yes, uh, yes, that's uh, definitely a very important area. Our group and our research uh, has uh, always had a big emphasis on ethical, social, cultural uh, dimensions of the research we do. Therefore, trying to be very conscious uh, that uh, the research we do, which is mainly supported by uh, public funding, um, has to um, identify and, and make sure that we respond to the, the social needs, the cultural needs, and that especially nowadays in an area in which uh, technology has uh, such an important role in uh, society uh, to bring this ethical perspective and to make sure that the technologies that we develop uh, have a positive impact in, uh, in our lives and in culture in particular. And related to that, um, uh, from very early on, uh, I we realized that uh, without us knowing, and especially engineers, uh, we are developing technology that might create quite a bit of harm, biases, um, social that might have a social impact that is not the one that we would like to have. Technologies are used uh, um, throughout uh, many of our uh, activities and uh, many times without us knowing it, uh, these uh, technologies uh, are promoting certain uh, cultural imperialism perspective or they are uh, promoting certain cultural biases that are quite important and we many times forget. So of the research that we have done, um, we, we have uh, worked on some topics that uh, directly address these aspects. For example, uh, one of the first that uh, we did was related uh, to um, basically trying to preserving and trying to um, capture the, the, the sounds of the world, basically. So try to make sure that um, the sounds that uh, people record all over and that capture the, 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 the different uh, mm -hmm. uh, types of cultures, the different types of sounds that uh, different cultures make, that they are preserved. And that uh, was uh, became uh, freesound.org. Uh, Freesound is a is a platform, a web platform that um, is supported with uh, uh, Creative Commons licenses. Uh, this is a type of legal licenses that uh, were developed uh, in the around maybe close to uh, twenty years ago, fifteen years ago. Uh, that um, make sure that the authors, the, the, the people that own the sounds, can decide what they want to do with them. Um, and that uh, was a very nice initiative um, that was uh, basically finding an alternative to the traditional copyright initiatives and the, the copyright societies. And um, with Creative Commons, um, People can reuse sounds. Uh, musicians can can use uh, these sounds to make music with. Uh, we can do research with them, and therefore we can uh, open up the the research activities within the music technology field quite a lot. 
And now Freesound has become uh, an amazing resource uh, with millions of users, with hundreds of thousands of sounds, with uh, many, many uh, uses of these sounds in many types of applications. And that uh, has been a, a very important initiative in which uh, we develop technologies to support it. So the idea is that it's not enough to just put a repository, but you need to uh, develop technologies that facilitates the organization of these sounds, the searching of these sounds, the distribution of these sounds, and that therefore these sounds can be found, uh, can be uh, identified, and then therefore people can have access to them. So that has been a very important initiative. Related to that, but uh, that's a little bit quite different and related to music, um, quite early on, and, but that maybe not, is not that long ago, around uh, 10 years ago, uh, I was invited to India to give a series of talks on these uh, technologies related to music information retrieval, related to machine learning, related with signal processing. Um, and I realized on, on that visit and giving uh, talks to a number of universities and uh, many very bright uh, university students, that the technologies that we were developing were not adequate for their cultural and musical uh, repertoires. So the, the most of the technologies that we were developing had a very Western-centric uh, bias, uh, were based on ideas, concepts of Western music, and therefore they were not adequate to analyze, preserve, describe um, the music of India. So because of that, then uh, we started a very large project funded by the European Commission to uh, target that, to try to develop technologies that would uh, be able to uh, work, to analyze, to describe um, music that was not this tonal bass, uh, uh, harmonic bass, uh, pop music of the Western world. Um, and uh, we have done a lot of research trying to work with different music traditions of the world and trying to push these technologies to uh, be adequate for these non-Western, let's say, music traditions. And I guess that would be two, two ideas behind this idea of preserving and, uh, and, and trying to uh, make sense and, uh, and making justice to the richness of our world of sound and music. Um, uh, congratulations for the project. It's really, really beautiful. And then that, that it's wonderful to listen about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a, a question, Professor. Uh, uh, professor, uh, um, in terms of copyrights, uh, uh, your explanation is, is perfect, but... Uh, uh, um, take a look in about this new scenario, uh, artificial intelligence um, and, and new technologies. Uh, uh, what is your opinion about the, the, the increase of opportunities of business in this area? Uh, well, of course, technology has always had a fundamental role in uh, music making, in music business. Uh, the industry of music, but also in the sector of music in general. So every new technology has opened up new creative opportunities, new business opportunities. And of course, along with that uh, has uh, brought some problems that sometimes we have successfully addressed, sometimes uh, we have not. Um, so now with AI, that's a really a major development that uh, opens up uh, many opportunities, but that brings many challenges, many legal challenges, many creative challenges, many ethical challenges, that if we, the, the music sector uh, and the ecosystem around it, is able to uh, take, uh, um, let's say, the, the opportunities and, and drive them correctly, I think it will have a, a huge uh, benefits. But there is a lot of challenges that currently uh, we, sh we should be very much worried about, some uh, related with um, 
the world of creativity, uh, the world of uh, how music uh, is uh, is made, and um, uh, the cultural uh, aspects of that. And uh, uh, one of the claims that when internet started was that okay, now uh, music uh, can be accessed by any anyone from everywhere. So we will be democratizing the music. That's not that easy, and that's not been the case. So in fact, in some way, we are doing worse than some years ago with uh, CDs and with uh, radios, and uh, we are um, narrowing down a lot of the opportunities and a lot of the access to music and, and giving a voice to every musician of the world and opening up the creativity. Uh, so unless it's done correctly, uh, we might be in danger to uh, doing a lot of harm to the music uh, world. Um, another question. Um, if, if you could uh, give us, in your opinion, what's the three points in the state of the art from the music and technology right now? And for the academic or the industry, I, I don't know, as you want, uh, if you could share with us these three points in your opinion. Sure. Um, well, um, I don't know about three. I'm going to start with one and then uh, two and then see where we get. But uh, <laughs> okay. clearly uh, the main, um, let's say, uh, 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 sort of technological development that has uh, is having a huge impact is uh, all what we, well, the area of machine learning, in particularly the area of deep learning, in which uh, we can now uh, develop technologies uh, by uh, simply being able to put together large uh, data collections that exemplify a particular plot problem. Uh, so the idea is that uh, until recently, in order to come up with a solution to, to uh, solve a particular task, uh, that being audio compression, being source separation, being uh, classification of musical genres, you had to understand the problem uh, from an audio signal processing point of view, from a musicological point of view. And uh, only after that, you could uh, then develop uh, an algorithm, a software that could solve that problem. That uh, was uh, very, very hard for, uh, for uh, extending it to, to, to large uh, problems and to in a general context. Now with deep learning, with all these new machine learning uh, systems, if we are able to, to put together an adequate data set, adequate corpus, we can approach it without having to understand every single detail. You know, traditionally, science evolved by understanding a problem and then uh, bringing it uh, to the engineers and being able to develop solutions from that understanding. Now it's not needed anymore, and we can solve problems without completely fully understanding the issues behind. Of course, this is bad and good, so we have to be careful. But clearly, that's a major revolution. The, the second one, and it's completely related to this one, and uh, of course, is the, the, the data. So at the end, the, the, the main challenge and the main aspect that uh, we as uh, people that worry about this ethical, this cultural, these cultural uh, aspects of all what we do, the data that we start from is where we have to pay most attention on. So... Um, research on deep learning is based on collecting data. And of course, you have to collect data fairly. So you, you want to do uh, legally, you want to do uh, uh, collect that data. You want to collect data that is adequate for the task, that is meaningful, that makes sense, that is, uh, is, is adequate to study the problem that you want. And, uh, and that becomes a huge problem in which uh, not just engineers uh, are involved, but all the stakeholders 
of uh, the musical sector and the industrial sector and uh, and the, the policy makers are involved. So how do we make sure that we can uh, put together data that benefits and that is uh, is not harming and is not uh, doing anything against any possible uh, uh, issue that might arise? So data is a is a is a fundamental aspect for that. And then, uh, again, related to that, uh, the, 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 another fundamental element that we used to not pay attention to, and now it's a, a completely uh, fundamental element of our research, are related to all the ethical issues. Research on ethical issues was not uh, a significant aspect of our research. And now is at the core of everything we do. Uh, before we start a problem, while we do the problem, when we evaluate it, we have to pay attention to ethical things, to biases, to gender issues, to cultural issues, to uh, fairness, to uh, open science, to uh, be able to involve society, to be able to uh, to promote technologies that promote uh, a more fair and democratic world. That kind of thing is now really part of the research. Uh, is not just an afterthought. It's not just uh, some secondary thing, but it's a fundamental element. So I don't know. So I just tried to put three things together that are very much related. One is all the technologies related with deep learning and all the, the really hardcore um, sort of AI uh, techniques that are behind that. And there is a lot of very challenging things. The other is the data, which is uh, indispensable for doing this uh, deep learning model, but it has a life on its own. And the other is uh, all these ethical issues, which without them, I don't think we will do uh, good research. We will not uh, do research that really benefits our world and our society. And we have to be very much uh, involved in, the, in defining what that means. So great. Uh, um, your uh, research group uh, is, is very huge. It's a very deep uh, um, uh, research. Uh, what are your recommendations for our students and teachers? We have a lot of engineers, students, uh, in, engineers, students uh, here in Mawa, business administration, designers and uh, uh, TI uh, students. What are recommendations if uh, a teacher or a student uh, gets some interest to develop a research group like your research group? Okay, so first of all uh, is to understand the field and understand that it's not anymore a kind of discipline, uh, monothematic uh, type of area that has a particular methodology, a particular set of goals. The area of music technology has completely opened up. Uh, it's really multidisciplinary. Um, and therefore, everyone can uh, play a role in it. So everyone can contribute um, to uh, advance the 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 feel of uh, of uh, music technology uh, from their perspective and from their uh, specific background so what is always very very important is to um, understand the state of the art and that's not easy so to try to understand where things are so that you are not reinventing the wheel so that you are not focusing on a problem that has no solution. And there are many of those. I mean, currently in the media, on the newspapers, on TV, we hear um, um, sort of stories about where AI is going to go and what is it doing. Most of those stories are exaggerations, are science fictions, are things that do not relate to the day-to-day -day work of researchers. So it's important to understand what this uh, really uh, technological development and research in a field of music technology is. And then 
uh, once you understand that, and that sometimes is not easy because the information is out there. The, the on, online you can find zillions of resources for doing that, but you need to have some guidance on what to look at, what to focus on, and what to read. Some things might be very difficult to understand. Some things might be insignificant, etc. So you have to know what to, to read, what to focus on. But then in parallel to that, what is important is once you understand that, you have to understand what is your background? What is your, what are your strengths? What are your motivations? What, uh, what are really, uh, where do you come from? So um, it's it's uh, not everyone can do everything, uh, and but everyone has a, a, a place and has a, a, an adequate know-how for some particular task. So it's very very important to uh, understand your strength, your background, the things that you might be able to accomplish by studying something, but may not be accomplished because. You, that's not your particular interest. So you, not everyone has to be an AI engineer to contribute to these. Not everyone has to be uh, an excellent musician to contribute to this uh, or an excellent designer. There's, there is room for many, many uh, different tasks and contributions. But related to that, so you need to know your background, your, uh, your, the things that you are passionate about, that you really uh, can do but also where you want to go, when you want to reach. Uh, it's important to, to carry out research with a, with a goal-oriented uh, aim so that uh, there are so many and it's so easy to get distracted and, and, and keep jumping from one to another. That would be very difficult to, to develop anything significant if you don't have a particular goal. So you need to try to figure out what is that goal and uh, what do you want to accomplish and be very realistic about the potential of doing that. And maybe finally, if I had to say something, it used to be that research and this type of work was very individual, that uh, people would uh, just, okay, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to work on this, and, and, uh, and that's, I'm going to publish this, and that's it. Now, I don't think that makes much sense at all. Uh, most of the research that uh, is relevant and most of the work that is relevant in our fields requires collaboration. So there is no way you on your own will be able to carry out some things that you hope to be significant. So you have to collaborate. You have, you have to find teams. You have to uh, find projects in which to be part of. And that doesn't mean to have people on your own institution. One of the amazing things of uh, internet and uh, all the social networks and all the online resources, uh, et cetera, allows us to collaborate uh, with people from around the world. There are zillions of very interesting open projects uh, that uh, anyone can contribute to. There are zillions of, uh, of uh, repositories, software repositories, data sets, uh, initiatives that uh, um, anyone can contribute to. And by uh, being part of those initiatives uh, will allow you to, to really be able to do something that on your own would be impossible. And so that to basically build on collaborative uh, work and build on the shoulders of whatever people have done before you. So that might be some recommendations. Thank, thank you, Professor. Thank you. Very, very important words. Thank you very much. Professor, I have a, a last question. Uh, if we could um, give a message to our students and maybe try just to, to, to push. And uh, uh, I saw in Netflix production for Andrew Warhol, the, the voice of Andrew Warhol is a kind of AI uh, uh, software that uh, created the, the Andrew Warhol voice. And if you, I don't know if it's easy to do right now, but if you could uh, split in competence this, this, this idea of the area or disciplines or something like that, what is important to achieve this? And the second, uh, the complementary question to this is, if one of our students wants to go to your university, um, 
what is the process if you give some ideas to how to apply, what is important to, to the background, to the motivation, well, as you, as you want to say, to, to, to give this, this message to, just to the students. Okay, good. Uh, if I understood correctly, the, the first question is basically the technologies that can uh, imitate uh, the voice of someone that uh, is uh, dead or that uh, does not exist uh, anymore and that we can reconstruct it with AI. Is that, uh, I guess, the question? Yes, and the idea of this question is, uh, for example, it's the model-based uh, approach uh, or it's not. What's the background to do this? If you could split, or, uh, you need to understand uh, some uh, some parts of the human nature or not, or it's a mathematical modeling, or it's a software, it's a previous knowledge, but I don't know. So I first, let me, let, let, let me talk about a project that we have been working on for uh, 20 years. Uh, together with Yamaha, uh, together with Yamaha, uh, I work at Yamaha when uh, when uh, it was in the U.S. and the aim was to develop a singing voice synthesizer. So I started working on singing voice, and of course at that time the idea of the singing voice uh, was uh, difficult. It was uh, based on uh, signal processing techniques, uh, quite demanding, quite uh, computationally expensive. So we started uh, by um, analyzing uh, voices of, uh, of singers and uh, in a kind of pseudo manual type of uh, uh, task by building collections of the sounds of a particular singer, uh, like a text to speech uh, synthesizer uh, would do at that time, we wanted to do it in music, which was a little bit harder because of the variability of sounds the complexity of the expression that music has compared with the speech. And uh, we succeeded a little bit, and out of that came uh, a very well-known singing voice synthesizer, which is uh, called Vocaloid. And uh, within Vocaloid, uh, there is one singer that has become internationally very, very well-known, which is Hatsune Miku. If you look at uh, YouTube Hatsune Miku, you will discover an amazing world of virtual singers that uh, that give concerts, that uh, have CDs, uh, and that have an amazing uh, musical life. Um, but of course, that requires uh, to bring uh, a singer into a studio, record the different sounds, and make sure that you can... Uh, capture all the essential elements of a particular voice. And once you have that, you can make this singer sing anything. With deep learning, with AI, in the last uh, few years, uh, this, uh, this type of research has been revolutionized. And, and now uh, with the Vocaloid related technologies, we have been able to have uh, singers from the past, especially in Japan, to uh, come back to the stage and uh, and sing songs that they have never seen sung before and this has been done also in speech and of course this is based on the idea of this uh, database uh, type of uh, um, uh, kind of uh, analysis uh, of deep learning in which uh, you might not need a very well-crafted collection of sounds, but if you have enough recordings from that singer, from that person, um, in a kind of black box type of approach, and not completely black box, but a little bit, uh, you can try to reproduce the sound of someone that uh, is, is dead. And this has been uh, quite successful and uh, it has been brought for movies and for, uh, for music uh, in quite a few situations. And, uh, and I think clearly that will continue. And uh, that's a, a, a typical example of the potential of uh, deep learning, which of course requires quite a bit of uh, uh, engineering uh, expertise, but again, this type of research requires multidisciplinary teams, requires people that are experts in music, uh, people that are experts in recording, people that are experts in, in, in controlling this type of, of algorithms, and of course, 
hardcore uh, engineers, experts in AI. So this is very much exemplifies a typical type of research that many people want to get into and the type of research that uh, the, the people that study with us um, are trained to be able to do. Uh, so in uh, our institution at the, the Pompeu Fabric University and within the music technology group, Every year, uh, there is around uh, 25 master students that uh, join, that we select uh, from uh, all around the world, that it's a quite competitive process, but we try to bring people from a, a diversity of backgrounds, having enough engineering education that they allow, they can understand uh, a, a lot of the technical issues, but coming from different backgrounds. And of course, we also accept a number of PhD students depending on the projects we have active and, uh, and, uh, and the funding that we have to support PhD students. Master students, normally they, they pay their way in, so it's much easier to be accepted. PhD students are selected based on the, the, the projects, the funding, the support that we have. So, and clearly are much more advanced people, but most of the time, the PhD students that we select have done their, the, the master students that we offer. And in the master students, uh, typically, of course, we are looking for someone that has a sufficient background in programming and in signal processing, uh, so uh, typical subjects that are uh, given in a computer science degree. But of course, we are looking for people that have a musical background, uh, people that have uh, the motivation to, to really get into all these things and the understanding of all these aspects, challenges, and, uh, and, uh, and um, um, considerations that our field requires. So... Yeah, so there is uh, quite a lot of opportunities to join our group, uh, but of course uh, it's a it's a it's a selective process. Uh, there is a number of universities around the world offering uh, similar educational opportunities. Not that many, uh, but uh, so uh, many uh, apply to our group, and uh, we are able to to accept. Uh, quite a, a few of them, not, of course, uh, only a percentage of them, but we can accept uh, a few of them every year. Thank you, Professor. Well, it was really a wonderful conversation. Uh, I don't know if you can want to... Thank you very much, uh, Professor van der Leij, for the invitation. Thank you, Professor uh, Javier, uh, by the uh, learning and to the opportunity to share uh, this knowledge with our students. Thank you very much. And I, I believe a, a second conversation in the future could be very interesting because there are a lot of curious things uh, that we could explore right now. And as we say here in Brazil, it's a good conversation for uh, uma conversa de boteco. <laughs> boteco is a kind of place that we find friends and we can talk with interesting things and plans about the futures and as we are happy yes, today, yes, and yes, it's, a, it's a happiness. It's a, it's a, it's a really a good place to to be to discuss this kind of yes, thing yes, 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 <laughs> here. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, Professor. Excellent. Yeah, I guess we 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 could only uh, explain the 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 very generic uh, kind of things. It's always uh, uh, difficult to to go deep into some of these topics because there are many, and as soon as you get deep, uh, it's uh, starting to be quite uh, complicated. But uh, but anyway, I hope uh, this uh, kind of superficial type of presentation is adequate for uh, your students and uh, the kinds of things that you want to do. So okay, thank you. Thank it you was very wonderful. Much. Yes, thank you. E aí, gostou desse Mauá Cast? O próximo também será bem bacana. E você pode mandar suas sugestões de temas, viu? Até o próximo!